Let's go on to reasonable efforts. Okay, reasonable efforts. And what, is, what do reasonable efforts have to do with court improvement? All right. For some reason, this whole conference, this whole outfit here is named reasonable efforts. That's nice. Let's talk about it for a while. What does it mean? Reasonable efforts is the legal tool by which the court reviews the actions of the Child Protection Welfare Agency to determine whether they are fulfilling their statutory duties. Okay, that's a tight definition. It's the most powerful tool that the court has. You see, the federal government, and this is all contained in the Improving Implementation article, which is in your materials, the federal government decided that the state child welfare agencies were not doing their job. And this is all the way back in 1980. And they said, we need somebody to watch the agency and to make findings about whether the agency is doing its job. We choose the courts. The agency was very unhappy about that. The courts were very unhappy about that. In fact, the uh, court is telling the agency, you've done your job or you haven't done your job. You've fulfilled your responsibility towards the client, towards the family, towards the child, or you're not. And also, you have fulfilled your promise to the federal government that you're going to use their dollars to prevent removal, to provide reunification, and to, pro and to provide timely permanency. That's the deal you've made with the federal government. Who's watching over at the courts? Ah. Okay, reasonable efforts is a term of art. Everybody's unhappy about this. All the academicians said, let's define reasonable efforts. No definition other than the one I gave you. Because it's the amount of work or services that social and social worker effort that the law requires, depending on the problem, depending on the community. It is a term of art. It's shaped by the community, and it's determined by the judge or the appellate court if the case is appealed. So what may be reasonable in one community may not be reasonable in another. The juvenile court has got to make reasonable efforts findings at three critical points. This is federal law telling us to do this. And one is, at the initial hearing, did the agency provide services that are reasonable that prevented or could have prevented the removal of the child? Pre-preventive placement services, really important. Coming back to this. At the disposition, has the agency provided such services and is the agency providing ongoing services to permit the parents to rehabilitate and return to uh, have the child return? And then after a permanent plan has been set, and this is the one that ASFA added in 1997, it wasn't in the original law, is the agency taking sufficient steps to get the child to permanency? When I showed up in my court, there were a thousand cases, a thousand children waiting for permanency. And one of the social workers took me aside and said, we don't really work on those cases because, because the parents are out of the picture and the child is with the adoptive home or the guardianship home, and we don't think that the final legal step is so important. I said, oh, yes, it is. And I just raised hell. And so we did, in about a year, we got 1,000 cases reduced off the caseload. And then later on, the law was passed to say that I did what I should have done. And that is push the system to make sure that the child reaches timely permanency so the adoption is finalized. And in order to do that, guess what? I had to learn, the whole system had to learn every step of the adoption process, every step. So we found out whose desk it was on, how long it had been there, what a home study was, what the, the snags in home studies were, and that's what we talk about in court when we would come back for 30-day reviews until the finalization was complete. But that's our job, isn't it? That's the job of the court. Now, the other finding the court can make is no reasonable efforts. This means the agency hasn't done its job. And in this particular case, under these circumstances, the agency has not done its job. 
the agency does not like to get no reasonable efforts finding on the record. You all know why that is true. Because when the federal government comes in to do its audit and it sees a no reasonable efforts finding, they take money away. They say, oh, the agency didn't do its job. Give us back that money. Give us back the money we gave you to do the job because you didn't do it. This is why it's a powerful tool. Now, what I'm going to point out to you is that in your materials, I talk about reasonable efforts in a couple of different places. But on page 69, I write a letter to the uh, Department of Social Services and tell them why I'm making a no reasonable efforts finding. And at the end of that letter, I send copies to every polit politician in the community. I only did this once or twice. But I picked an issue out that I said to myself, based on my knowledge, that this is a service that should be provided to families in the community. In this case, it was providing a home for teen mothers and babies, and their babies, who can't live with their own family. And I said, this is a service that should be provided in our community, and I'm making a no reasonable efforts finding, and I'm letting the world know about it. It's nothing secret about it. And you know why I did that? Because the people who could fix it weren't necessarily the people in the department. It was people outside the department. And guess what? We got a ton of homes now that'll take teenage moms and their babies who can't live with their uh, with, uh, mother and grandmother. So the, that's one thing you can do with the reasonable efforts finding. You use it to upgrade the system. A second way of doing it is, now, we're going to talk to you about this. Let's do some hypotheticals. Number one, an attorney asked the court to order 24-7 in-home support services for an at-risk family to ensure protection for the children. And everybody agrees that this service is necessary to keep the family together. Without this service, children have to be removed. And the agency says, Judge, that's putting too much of our scarce resources into one family. We object to this. So is that a reasonable efforts or no reasonable efforts? Raise your hand if you think that's reasonable and the agency should be required to do it and the court should make a no reasonable efforts finding. Raise your hand if you think it's unreasonable. Well, unreasonables have it about two to one. My own, my own community, I'd say that's not reasonable. That's too much resources for one family. But I would love to hear a good argument on the other side. How about this? this parents say they are necessary to prevent removal. This is the same case. And the agency is saying it costs too much money. And the agency is saying, look, we have an obligation to the whole community. If we put all our money into one family here, there are 10 other families that we could prevent with lesser amounts of money, and therefore, we shouldn't be required to do this. That's a good case to have a nice discussion in court, a reasonable efforts discussion. And your ruling, I already asked you that. Sometimes I get ahead of myself. OK, an attorney argues that a mother has been unable to visit her child because the department has not provided transportation. And she is poor, and she doesn't have any transportation. Is this a denial of reasonable efforts? What's your ruling? Yes, hands up. No, hands up. I got no hands on that one. Unanimous. In Washington, you expect your agency to provide transportation for visitation. In other places, much shakier, much shakier. I was down in Siskiyou County, which is on the Oregon border with California, very rural county, very difficult to provide visitation. Buses go once a day into some parts of the county. So visitation will change from county to county. Riverside's bigger than Tennessee, Riverside County. They go 250 miles from one end of the county to the other. That's tough on visitation if you happen to place your kids there. OK, here's the one I talked about before. An attorney for a teenage mother asked the court to order the agency to place the mother in a foster home that will accept her and her infant. Would the agency's failure to do so 
be the basis for a no reasonable efforts finding. Who thinks the agency has an obligation to provide that home for the mother and child? Okay, okay. who thinks that's unreasonable? Okay, we got a split there. More people think yes, they should. I came down on the yes in my community. I don't know what it would be like in your community. I would think King County. I would think King County ought to be able to come up with that. And if I were, but, but remember, I'm, I'm an outsider here. I don't know your community that well. That's why a local judge should make that ruling. Okay. How many of you have heard of wraparound services? About half? More of you need to know about wraparound services. Okay. The attorney, GAL for the child, comes to court and says, I want wraparound services for my client to live at home or in with Aunt Tilly or whatever because the, my, child's got, the, my, my client's got mental health problems and she can remain at home with her family with, wrap, with wraparound services. The agency says, these, ex these services are too expensive. We're not going to do it. So how many think that it's reasonable to, for the court to order wraparound services? How many think it's unreasonable, too expensive? Oh, wow, unanimous. I love it. We've been doing wraparound services for about 10 years in my county. I have a film on it. I'll send it to you if you want it. We have taken every kid in institutional care out of institutional care and placed them with families. We've saved a lot of money. A lot of money. But money is only one argument. And for me, the most important argument is we have children placed with families. And that is where children belong. And that is why wraparound services are so wonderful. And the attorneys in my court come in, and you can hear, you know what's happening before the case starts. They say, Your Honor, I want wraparound services. This child can go here with wrap. And it's a second, I'm going to give you one more thing about wraparound. Wraparound has been proven to be so effective that there is a lawsuit now pending in California that is asking that every child is entitled to wraparound services in the state. The judge has ruled yes based on agency testimony that yeah, it works, and yeah, it's the best thing around, but we can't afford it. And we are expecting this case to change the way we do business and have wraparound available for everybody. Well, federal court, it's going to get around, folks, and so wraparound services is something that you need to have a dialogue with your agency about how much they're using RAP and how much more they could use it. What is wraparound? Wraparound is a, a, a different approach to cases. And what happens is that a team is formed. And the team includes professionals, usually less than 50%, and community members, teachers, coaches, neighbors, relatives, and they plan for the child's life on a 24-7 basis. Who's going to be there from 4 in the afternoon to 5 in the afternoon? Who's going to be there from 5 to 6? And they plan it so there's an adult ready all times of the day, seven days a week. Wrap means the child is wrapped in services, wrapped in observation, wrapped in adult supervision. And the team meets regularly. They are committed forever. They don't give up until the, the, the kid's behavior permits the rap to loosen up and move away. So that what you're doing is you're training good behavior in the community such that instead of taking the child out of an institution and bringing her home, and then she has to adjust to home, you're keeping her at home and the supervision is provided in the home and loosens up. It's magic, folks. It's absolutely magic. It's got good data behind it. It's the best practice. And I'm hopeful that you can have a dialogue about bringing it to Washington more than you have it already. OK, how about this? The prospective adoptive mother and says, why hasn't the adoption been completed? And the agency says, ah, we're too busy. And home studies take a long time. Is this an issue deserving a no reasonable efforts finding? Yes? 
No. It's a yes. It's a clear yes. But I'll t I told you, this is a more recent addition to the law in 1997. A child is removed from mom's custody and the social worker discovers, no, when the social worker discovers that mom has been the victim of repeated domestic violence and the child has been exposed to that violence. Is there a reasonable efforts issue in this case? Anybody want to try? You think so? Yes? No? A lot of people are wondering what's going on with this case. All right? This was the hottest case in the country about four years ago out of New York City, the Nicholson versus Scopetta case, but it's a case that we have embraced in our jurisdiction. The fact that you are a victim of domestic violence should not be a reason for removing your child. Okay? That's flat out. And this is, this is, this is all about the Green Book Project, and I, it's a different speech, different time, but the agency has an obligation to help protect the mother, to find her the shelter where she could live with her child safe from the batterer. If she's unwilling to go, that's a different issue. But if she's willing to go, you've got to offer her that. And in fact, the New York federal judge, and affirmed by the, both in the state and the federal, uh, federal court system was, it's unconstitutional to remove a child in those circumstances. And of course, it's re-victimizing the mother. So this is an issue that you may not have been thinking about very much. I've got a lot of material on it. And if you're interested, email me. I'll send it to you. That's, or you can just look, up, look at that. I got the federal citations right there for you. Ah, I'm not so dumb. I don't, don't email me. I don't want to hear your email. <laughs> yes, Commissioner. Uh, generally, you have a lot of cases where it's not just domestic violence victim who has a repeated, I mean, that's a whole different situation. So, but you have threats involved, you have sure, uh, sure. the victim is actually abusing the child, you have a lot of different issues. So it's not uh, just the oh, sole no, that's issue. a different case. Yeah, yeah. No, the, 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 the commissioner was making the point that there's usually more there. And that's fine. If, the, if mom's a, a meth addict, well, that's... That's its own problem, and that may lead to a removal. But if DV is the issue, and it's the only issue, then that's what these cases are talking about. And there were a whole bunch of them. The New York uh, social service system was just like the dog catcher, picking them all up. Okay, now we come to the question of why should a judge make a no reasonable efforts finding if the state's going to lose money? After all, the judge lives in the state. You don't want to see your state have less money, particularly when your agencies haven't got enough money to begin with. Shouldn't the judge just go along with it? Rubber stamp. Well, a, a parallel question is, is the judge just there to rubber stamp what the district attorney does when they come in in a criminal case? Is that what a judge's role is? There are some judges somewhere who think so. And I strongly disagree that when I took an oath of office, when we all took an oath of office, it was to follow the law, and the law is to review, to inquire, to find out what's going on and whether they've met burdens. I don't think that, that's a pretty easy point for you folks. However, what about the strategy of the no reasonable efforts finding, the art? And you say to them, you have not done a reasonable job in this case. I'm going to make a no reasonable efforts finding, but I will hold it in abeyance for one week. And we'll come back to court in one week. Guess what happens in one week? They've done it. And I don't have to make the finding. So using the threat, and it's a serious threat, I'll make it. If they don't do it, you can get action out of the agency that they may have missed on. Thank you. Thank you.